السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى خاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وعلى ابن عمه علي أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما وليكم الله ورسوله والذين آمنوا الذين يقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة وهم راكعون ومن يتولى الله ورسوله والذين آمنوا فإن حزب الله هم الغالبون صدق الله العلي العظيم Tonight is the night of the strike, the fatal strike of Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Qa'id al-Muwahideen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wassalam whose life is divided into three main phases and sections. First one is from birth which took place 10 years before the Bi'atha, before the beginning of Islam, and 23 years before the Hijrah, the immigration of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina. Until the day he left Mecca, he was 23 years old. The second phase is when he arrived in Medina and was always with his father-in-law and his mentor and his friend and his teacher Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the third phase when he moved was he, he was elected as the Caliph and he moved from Medina to Kufa until the day of his martyrdom which was on the 21st of the month of Ramadan. So these are the three phases I am going to speak tonight about the third one. Part of the third phase of his life and legacy. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam lived for 63 years. He was born on 13th of Rajab, 23 years before the Hijrah, and he was martyred on the 21st of Ramadan, 40 years after Hijrah. So altogether they make 63 years. And when he was elected as a Caliph, he was 58 years old. And it lasted only four years and nine months. He was elected in Dhul Hijjah, year 35, and he was martyred, assassinated in Ramadan, year 40. So his reign lasted less than five years. And within these five years, though it was short, but he presented a paradigm for social justice, and equality and respect for a human dignity and a human life. He was able to establish, to accomplish nation building, a state which is still today an example for presidents and rulers and 10 years ago, the United Nations under Kofi Annan recognized 
the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib as a model for peace, security, and justice. And Kofi Annan himself, he said, I invite the Arab leaders and the Muslim leaders to take the model presented by Ali ibn Abi Talib in his short period, his short reign, as an example that they follow. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to him what would happen to him during his leadership. The Prophet said to him, Ya Ali, Satuqatilu min ba'di anna kithina wal mariqina wal qasitin. After you became caliph, you're going to resist and you're going to fight these three groups. The first one are the Nakithin. Nakithin are those who are disloyal and faithful. Those who paid allegiance to him in the beginning, but because of their personal interests, they deflected. They rejected him. And they launched a war against him. Those who breached the bay'ah, the allegiance, the covenant that they made. This story started only five months after the beginning of his leadership. Amir al-Mu'mineen was elected as a leader in the Hijjah 35. And the Battle of Jamal took place in Jumad al-Ula only five months after that. Primarily by two people who got together and eluded a second per a third person into traveling hundreds of kilometers from Mecca and Medina to Basra in southern Iraq and launch the battle of Al Jamal, the camel. Those two people were the companions of the Prophet. One of them is Talha ibn Ubaidullah and the other was Az Zubair ibn al Awam. And Az Zubair was at the same time the cousin to the Prophet and the cousin to Imam Ali himself. But politics knows no families, no boundaries, no ethics, no principles. Imam Ali, after the assassination of Uthman, Uthman was murdered in his house in Medina. And the city of Medina was left with no leader. And the whole state, Islamic state, was left with no leader for seven days. So people came to Imam Ali and they said to him, you are the best one to lead. Imam Ali said, I'm not interested in leadership. I'm not interested in leadership. They said, you have to lead. There is no other person who can salvage this ruined community, ruined country, except you. So they insisted on him. He said, find someone else. They said, there is no one other than you to take this responsibility. So they forced him to accept the position of leadership and Khilafah. And then they paid allegiance to him. But at the same time, there were others who refused to pay allegiance to him. They were part of the companions of the Prophet. They refused. Imam Ali said, leave them alone. This is a free society. They don't have to pay allegiance as long as they are good citizens they do not agitate leave them alone one of those who refused to pay allegiance to imam ali his name is abdullah ibn umar he's the oldest son son of the second caliph umar ibn khattab and he was also the companion of the prophet abdullah ibn umar was a companion of the prophet he said, I don't have a clear vision 
and I have doubt in my heart, so I'm not going to pay allegiance to Imam Ali. Imam Ali said, fine, don't pay allegiance. But imagine this man who refused to pay allegiance and shake hand with Ali. He went and he shook hand with Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Not only Yazid, after Yazid, another barbaric Daeshi came to power by the name of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, a murderer. Most of those leaders at that time, most of them were thugs and gang leaders in the shape of Islamic leader, Islamic caliph. Exactly what is happening today with ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Shabaab, Boko Haram, Boko Halal, all these groups. Group of thugs, they graduate from prisons, murderers, thieves. They come from broken families and they assume leadership. They appoint themselves caliphs, Khalifa, Khalifa to Muslimin. Yesterday they showed on television the palace where Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi used to live around Aleppo. A palace, huge palace, he built for himself. He calls people for jihad. He takes the youth from their mother's homes and send them to this inferno to, 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 to get killed. And he lives a very extravagant life, a very extravagant life. In the midst of this bloodshed, he enjoys his private life. They showed the palace around Halab where he lives. This is an example of Yazid, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, and Bani Umayyah, and Bani al-Abbas, and started, this corruption started first with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan who laid the foundation for corruption and dictatorship and abuse in Islam. So, Abdullah ibn Umar refused to shake hand with Ali because he was not clear about Ali ibn Abi Talib. But he went and he shook hand with Yazid. When Yazid became caliph, he said to the people of Medina, we have, this is Amir al-Mu'mineen. We cannot sleep the night if we don't do bay'ah to Amir al-Mu'mineen. So he paid allegiance to Yazid. Not only Yazid, Abdul Malik ibn Warwan came decades after Yazid and also um, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar also paid allegiance to him. But how did he pay allegiance to him? Abdullah ibn Umar was not in Damascus. Abdul Malik, the caliph, was in Damascus. Abdullah was in Iraq. And the governor of Iraq was Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi, the mass murderer. One of the biggest mass murderers in the history of mankind, Al-Hajjaj. So when Abdullah ibn Umar realized that Hajjaj is there, and Hajjaj is very brutal, and Hajjaj had killed Abdullah ibn Zubair because he revolted against Bani Umayyah, and he saw the body of Abdullah ibn Zubair being crucified, he came at midnight to the palace, he knocked at the door, he said, I have to meet Al-Hajjaj. They said to him, meet him tomorrow morning. He's asleep. He said, no, I need to see him tonight. Because the Prophet says, you cannot sleep the night if you don't pay allegiance to the Khalifa, to Amir al-Mu'min. Al-Hajjaj said, let him come inside. He was eating. Hajjaj he was eating. His hand was busy. He said to him, I know what brought you here. What brought you to my palace is not the hadith of the Prophet. It's the body of Abdullah ibn Zubair which is a crucified. You saw him and out of fear you came to pay allegiance. However, I and my hands are busy. Take my feet and shake hand, your hand with my feet. And he did. Read it in the history. This is Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab. But Imam Ali, he left them alone. Imam Ali did not chase his opponents. He did not persecute anyone. No persecution. During his time, the only government which did not have political prisoner was the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he gave full freedom 
He gave full freedom to his opponents to criticize him. Freedom of speech, freedom of political activities, freedom of dissent against the caliph. And the reason Ali was executed, because he did not have bodyguards. He didn't have bodyguards, the caliph. Therefore, it was easy for them to reach him, but not while he's sitting while he's prostrating, sujood. Because they said to Ibn, Ibn Abdurrahman, Ibn Muljam, the assassin, if you want to reach him, you cannot reach Ali. Ali is a brave and he's always alerted. One time he can reach him during the prayers. When he goes into salat, he forgets about himself. He focuses on his salat. That's the only opportunity you have. And thus he was killed during his prayers. So those two companions of the Prophet, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, second as Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, those people, they paid allegiance to him in the beginning, but then they said to him, one of them, he asked for the leadership of Yemen. The other said, I need Iraq. Imam Ali said to them, you are not fit to rule. I know you very well. You are not fit. So he refused. Imam Ali said, in my government, if you want me to be your leader, I have nothing called nepotism or favoritism. I appoint individuals according to their credentials, not their titles or their families or their bloodline or their friendship with me. I don't. If you are qualified, you become a governor. You work for me. If you are not qualified, please don't ask for that post. But they could not accept that because they were used. Let me tell you this. After the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no democracy in Islam. No democracy. Tribalism came back. Tribalism. What is a tribalism? Tribalism, if someone is elected as a caliph, he, bring, he brings all his family members to power, to the White House, to rule. Whether they are qualified or unqualified. Tribalism. And tribalism dominated Islam immediately after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. So Talha and Zubair, they were accustomed to this environment of tribalism. They were shocked when Ali said to them, no, I can't, because you are not qualified. They were shocked. So they said to him, if you don't appoint us as governors, allow us to go for Umrah. He said to them right away, I know your intention is not to go to Umrah to Mecca. Your intention is to mobilize the troops against me. You want to betray me, Ghadr, Ghadra. But he gave them permission to go to Mecca. They went to Mecca. And then they called Lady Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, to join them. Aisha was the wife of the Prophet, but she had a problem with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why she had a problem? Because Ali, the only human being who was the favorite of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was his sweetheart. And Ali was always with the Prophet at the request of the Prophet himself. Ali had unlimited access to Muhammad ﷺ. Oh. The Prophet gave him access into his private room any time of the day or the night. No one had such privilege in the history of Islam except Ali. Many wives, they came to terms with this. They understood that the Prophet, their husband, he loves Ali. So they have to bear with this. Others could not take this. Maybe because of their young age. Aisha was very young, 12, 13, 14, 15. Teenager. Now, some teenagers are educated by their parents, by their family members. They are 15 years old, but their brain, their mind, their etiquette, their adab is 40 years old. 
Aisha did not have this opportunity, unfortunately. So she had a problem with Ali. She was jealous of him. And she wanted her father to be the successor to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she succeeded in that, in appointing her father as the first caliph to the Prophet. So from day one, there were contention between Ali alayhi salam and Lady Aisha bint Abi Bakr. So they eluded her. As Zubair was married to Aisha's sister. Aisha had a sister called Asma bint Abi Bakr. So as Zubair was married to Asma, so through his wife, he was able to deceive Lady Aisha and bring her to Mecca as the wife of the Prophet, the ex-wife of the Prophet, to give legitimacy to his cause, to their cause, Talha and Zubair. And they were able to get 3,000 uh, 3, people, volunteers, to work for them. And while the caravan was moving from Mecca to Basra, another 17,000 joined them. A total of 20,000 fighters with Aisha, Zubair, and Talha. The Prophet one day was sitting among his wives. Please listen to this. The Prophet used to sometimes sit with one of them, sometimes with two, sometimes with more. And he addressed them. He said, my wives, listen to me carefully. Which one of the, you is going to ride a camel? And then the dogs of this specific area, Hawab, are going to bark at her. They said, what do you mean, Ya Rasulullah? Who's she? We don't know. Can you elaborate on this? He said, after my death, there will be a fitna, commotion among the Muslim community. One of you is going to ride the camel all the way from Mecca to Basra and ask people to rally people to fight my successor, one of you. And she is going to reach an area before Basra called Hawab. The sign of that, some dogs are going to bark at her. And then he turned to Aisha, he said to her, Iyaki an takuniha ya Humaira. Be careful, Humaira. Don't be that lady. So Aisha, he rem she remembers this. When she reached Hawab and the dogs were barking, she said, wow, my husband, the prophet, mentioned this 25 years ago. They said to her, some people, they came to her, they said, no, 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 this is not Hawab. This is another area. Don't worry about it. We will take care of it. So when they reached Basra, Imam Ali alayhi salam tried to reach a settlement. He had just had taken the leadership five months ago. Imagine, only five months ago. He took the responsibility of a state that was collapsing because of the economic policies of his predecessor. The government was bankrupt, financially, economically, socially, bankrupt. And Ali had the responsibility of putting this state together again, make it strong. And many people, they did not listen to him and they did not want him. The reason why Ali was unwanted by some, it was a personal reason. Because those corrupts among Quraysh were killed by the sword of Ali when they were polytheists, when they were launching wars against Islam in Badr, in Uhud, in Hunayn, in Ahzab, in others. Ali was the defense minister. The Prophet used to shield himself by Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali was the first protector of Islam, this newly built nation. Ali would, would put his life 
online to defend this newly established community. No one else was there. Whenever the Prophet asks for volunteer to defend him, nobody raises his head. During the Battle of Ahzab, a huge army surrounded Medina, a huge army. They came from all over the Arabian Peninsula. Some of them were polytheists, some of them were Christians, some of them were Jews, some of them were others, Arabs. They decided to wipe out this state. So they surrounded Medina. Medina was under siege for several weeks. And the Prophet وسلم, <laughs> did not have enough military means to defend the state. So at the suggestion of Salman al-Muhammadi, Salman al-Farisi, Salman said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, we don't have enough army to defend ourselves. I have an idea. We used to use this idea in Persia, in my country. Let's dig a trench, wide trench around Medina, so the army cannot cross this trench, Khanda, and attack Medina. And this is what they did. They started working day and night, including the Prophet himself, day and night, digging this huge Khandaq trench to protect Medina. The Prophet himself was work working, his family, his companions, all people were joined their effort to protect Medina. When the army arrived, the army of Ahzab, they saw Medina is protected. They cannot cross. They tried to cross. They could not. Then one day, one of their leaders, he jumped with his horse few meters he jumped off this trench and he came to the Muslim side. Imagine what happened to the Muslims when they saw Amr ibn Dilwit al-Amiri, a hero in the Arabian Peninsula. Huge, big hero. And he asked the Prophet for, to fight. He said, bring me one of your, your soldiers, your lieutenants. And then he started making fun, being sarcastic about the Muslims. He said, oh Muslims, doesn't this man Muhammad promise you about paradise? Whoever gets killed goes to paradise? Who wants to go to paradise? Come to me. No one wants to go to paradise. The Prophet would ask his community, can someone stand up to him? Nobody says anything except Ali. Ali says, Ana ya Rasulullah. Ali, he was 25 years old. Ana ya Rasulullah. Leave him for me. The Prophet said, Ali, sit down. Wait. Let's see another volunteer. The second time, the Prophet says, Man yabruz lahu wa ana afman ala Allah lahu al jannah. I guarantee that if he gets killed, he goes to paradise. Nobody answers. In the third time, each time Ali says, Ana, the Prophet eventually said, Ubruz barakallahu feek. You go to him, Ali. And then the Prophet said this sentence, eternal sentence. He said, Baraz al Islam kulluhu il al shirki kullih. The entire body of faith today stood represented in Ali. Ali is the embodiment of faith, Iman. Entire Iman, kulluhu il al shirk, standing up to defeat polytheism. And Ali finished him with one strike. With one strike, he finished the man. And the customs at that time, when you kill someone, you strip him of whatever he's wearing. It's yours. That's the rules in the battlefields. So Ali came to him, and then the Muslims are watching, but from, you know, maybe a few meters, they saw Ali stood again and he made a, a circle and then he came back and he cut his head. Some Muslims, they said, why Ali did not cut his head from the first time? The Prophet said, Ali will explain, wait for him. Let's wait for him when he comes. We ask him, why didn't he do this in the first time? So when Ali arrived carrying the head of Amr ibn Dilwit, the Prophet said to him, Ya Ali, why didn't you kill him the first time? He said, Ya Rasulullah, the first time I knelt down to cut his head, 
He spits in my face. And then he slanders my mother. And I was so angry. But I did not want to kill him to revenge my anger. I wanted to kill him for the sake of God. So I took a few minutes. I made a circle. Then why my anger subsided I came and I beheaded him because I wanted my deed to go only for the sake of God not personal issues so Ali when they arrived in Basra he tried to negotiate he said this is a Muslim ummah and we should not fight we should not fight we should make peace we should advocate peace. I'm not about to bloodshed. I'm about peace. I'm about forgiveness. I'm about a human dignity and human life. We should promote human life, not death. But they didn't listen. They said no. The only, the only way to revenge the death of Uthman is by murdering Ali. Imagine. And Uthman was murdered by people that were upset because of his policies has nothing to do with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Has nothing to do. Some historians believe that Ali sent his two sons, Hassan and Hussein, to defend Uthman. But the people, revolutionaries who revolted against him, they run down all those who were standing there and they were able, able to reach Uthman and they assassinated him. But Aisha came under this slogan, let's revenge for Uthman's death. History tells us that Aisha and Hafsa, the two wives of the Prophet, when Uthman became caliph, they went to visit him one day in Medina. They said to him, Ya Amir al muminin we are the two wives of the Prophet, and we want you to allocate, allocate some share some revenue of Baytul Mal, the treasury, for us. Because we are the wives of the Prophet and we have a share in this. Uthman said to them, said, but I know Aisha, you yourself, when the Prophet died and Fatima was asking, his daughter was asking about her share in the inheritance, you said that the Prophet says, we are the community of the messengers and the prophets. We leave no inheritance. Whatever we leave is not for our families. It's for the ummah. I heard you, Aisha, you saying this, right or wrong? Aisha said, right. He said, then you denied Fatima of her share and you are asking now for your share? Wasn't you, Aisha, who denied Fatima to Zahra of her share in her father's inheritance? Now you come and tell me to give you your, your share in inheritance? You have no share. So she left his office very angry. And immediately she said, Uqtulu na'thalan faqat kafar. Na'thal is a name of a Jewish person in Medina. So Aisha says, Uqtulu Na'thalan. Uthman becomes like Na'thal, the Jewish man. Kill him because he disbelieved. And she kept agitating against him until he died. Once he died, now she's asking Imam Ali for his blood. It was a fitna, definitely. And then the war erupted. Thousands of people died, unfortunately. Thousands of people died in the Battle of Jamal from both sides. And then the army of Aisha and Talha and Zubair collapsed. Talha was killed by one of his friends by the name of Marwan ibn al-Hakim. He killed Talha. As Zubair tried to run away, Zubair came confronting Ali. Ali said to him, Zubair, you are my cousin. Do you remember the day you were sitting next to the Prophet and I did something and you didn't like it. And you said to the Prophet, Ali cannot give up on his arrogance. You said this to the Prophet about me. The Prophet said to you, Zubair, leave Ali alone. Leave him alone. 
Do not harass Ali. A day will come that you're going to fight Ali. Do you remember that day? Zubair said, yes, I remember it very well. So he tried to go back. When he went back, his son and others, they said to him, are you coward? We came all the way from Medina to Basra to fight this man. And now, last minute, you want to change your mind? While he was making a U-turn, going back, someone hit him with, a, with an arrow and assassinated him. So Talha and Zubair died. The camel of Aisha collapsed. Aisha was captured, but Ali prevented people from harassing her, annoying her. He put her in a tent. He defended her. He came to her. He said to her, Ya Aisha, you are the wife of the Prophet. They did injustice to you rather than respecting you as they did, did that with their wives. None of them brought his wife outside to the battlefield. They eluded you. They deceived you. Ma an safuki. They did not do justice to you when they let, made you let, leave your house. While the Quran says, "Waqarna fi buyuti kunna wa la tabarrajna tabarraj al jahiliyat al ula." The Holy Quran says, "After the death of the Prophet, all the wives of the Prophet stay in your homes. Do not leave for agitation." But he defended her. And he sent her a brother with her, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, who was raised and nurtured by Ali himself, Muhammad. Muhammad was a few months old when his father Abu Bakr died, so he went into the custody of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali raised him, Ali taught him. He asked Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr rahmatullahi alayh, to take his sister back to Medina with 40 women dressed in men's clothing so nobody can intercept them on the way and she reached Medina this is the battle of Al Jamal tomorrow inshallah I'm going to speak about the others the battle of Al Nahrawan the battle of Safin before that and what made what are the events that led into the assassination of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wassalam. Tonight is the night that Ali is going to get wounded. Ali, who did not care about the war, Ali the bravest, Ali the defense minister, Ali who was wounded on the battle of Uhud with more than 70 wounds, in different parts of his body and he did not feel the pain tonight few hours from now at Adhan al of this man at the age of 63 is going to be wounded a fatal a fatal shot a fatal strike by Ibn Muljam before 34 years before his death or 38 years when Ali was 25 years old the Prophet stood speaking about the month of Ramadan telling the Muslims that the month of Ramadan is coming heralding the arrival of this month and when the Prophet was giving his speech, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he said, I asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, ma afdalu al-a'mal fi hadha al-shahr? What are the best deeds one can do during this month, the month of Ramadan? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Ali, afdalu al-a'mal al-wara'u an maharim Allah, al-wara'u, to stay away to stay away from sinning. Don't sin. That is the best deed, is not to sin. Not to do something shameful, something evil, something bad. That's the best deed in this month. If you can keep your mouth, your hands, your eyes, your ears, your heart safe during this month, that is the best deed. Al-wara'u an maharim Allah. Parhizi has gone off. Behtarin karhayin ma. Then the Prophet, when he said this, 
They saw the tears coming down the eyes of the Prophet. Ali was astonished. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ma yukik? Why do you cry? He said, Ya Ali, I'm crying for you. Abki lima yustahallu laka min damika fi hadha shah. This is 38 years before the incident. The Prophet says to Ali, I am, my tears are for you, for what is going to happen for you in the middle of this month when your sanctity is going to be breached and violated, when a murderer stands with his sword and he strikes you on your head. Your beard is going to be drenched with your blood. Ali, a young man of 25 years old, listened to his reaction rather than saying, Oh, Ya Rasulullah, I fear this. Why did you tell me bad news? He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, وَذَلِكَ فِي سَلَامَةٍ مِّن دِينِي When I am being killed, is my religion and my iman safe, intact? He says, ذَلِكَ فِي سَلَامَةٍ مِّن دِينِك Definitely, Ya Ali, your faith, your deen, your iman is very safe. Imam Ali said, then I would be happy to die for the sake of God. And he was waiting for that moment. From that day, Ali was not fascinated by this dunya. His wife Fatima was not fascinated by this dunya. His son Hussein. His son Hassan, his daughter Zainab, their grandfather, the Prophet, they were not fascinated by their dunya. Tilkat darul akhira, naj'aluha lilladheena la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wa la fasada, wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Their dream and their final destination was that life. They just wanted to pass it through this life, do good and leave this life. Not to cling into this life. They were not fascinated. They were not looking forward to live five more years, ten more years. Whatever God ordains for them, they would accept. As long as their iman and their faith is safe. They know this life is a transient. We pass it through it. It's a transit, it is a transit lounge. You don't stay in it. All what they wanted to do is to do good, is to pass the test. They are not seeking arrogance in, in this land. Neither corruption. They left with a clean record. Therefore, when he was stricken, the blood was coming down. His children were weeping. His friends and companions around him weeping. He would say to them, Ashabi, Ahla Bayti, La Tabku, La Tabku. Do not weep. For Allah, ma fajani min al mauti waridun karehtu, wala aridun ankartu, wama ana illa kawami in warad, au katalib in wajad, wama indallahi khayrun lil abwar. Do not weep for my departure. By God, I'm like a thirsty person in the middle of the desert where there is no water, and all of a sudden he finds water. Imagine his excitement. I'm so exciting. I'm going back to my Lord. I'm going back to my Lord. I've been waiting for these moments of shahada and martyrdom. To be reunited with my sweetheart Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With my wife Fatima who left many years earlier. I want to be reunited with them. I'm not fascinated by this life. I don't want to stay here longer. This is a privilege for me that I can go back to my Lord. Tonight, Ali ibn Abi Talib did not sleep at all. The night, the eve of the 19th, he spent this night in adoration and supplication and dua and istighfar. From time to time he leaves his room and he goes and he looks at the sky and he says here he a Laylatul Lati. Here he a Laylatul Lati wa Adani fiha Habibi Rasulullah. 
this is the night. I can tell. This is the night that I have been promised by my sweetheart Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would say, Wallahi ma kathibtu wa la kuthibt. Never I lied to anyone, neither I can believe a lie. I trust what the Prophet said. Tonight I can see the signs. Tonight is the night of my departure. And he had the privilege tonight to spend, to spend the night in the house of his daughter, Um Kulthum. During the month of Ramadan, he breaks his fast every night with one of his children. One night with Hassan alayhi salam, who's 37. One night, who's 38. One night with Hussein alayhi salam, who's 37. One night with Zainab. One night with Um Kulthum. Tonight was Um Kulthum's turn. Her daddy is with her in her house. She says, when he did his Maghrib prayers, he comes back from the mosque, short distance between the mosque and the house, and I presented him with his iftar. What was the iftar of Ali? A loaf of barley bread. Orson min khubz al-shair. Barley bread. And some yogurt. He said, Bunayya umma kulthum. I cannot have two meals in one session. I said, two meals? He said, yeah. Two types of food. Either you take the bread or the yogurt. I wanted to take the bread, he said, leave the bread, take the yogurt. And he broke his fast with one loaf of barley bread. That's it. That is the ta'am, the food of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because he said, I would not enjoy good food as long as there are poor people in my community. I have to equalize myself with the poorest of my subjects. With the poorest. And then he spent the night in ibadah, in istighfar, in a prayers, hatta talu al fajr, until the fajr arrived and Ali was ready to go to the masjid. Before fajr, Amir al Mu'mineen, he got dressed and he went to Masjid al Kufa. He went to the pulpit. That night, Ali himself, he wanted to raise the Adhan. He has a Mu'addin in the mosque, usually who raises the Adhan. But that night, Ali asked the Mu'addin that I want to raise the Adhan tonight. So he went to the pulpit, the member of Kufa, and he started raising the Adhan. Allahu Akbar. فَمَا كَانَ بَيْتٌ فِي الْكُوفَ إِلَّا وَوَصَلَهُ صَوْتُ الْإِمَامِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Historians say, when Ali said Allahu Akbar with his beautiful voice, his powerful voice, Allahu Akbar, Ali, who was born inside the Kaaba, and his very first utterance when he was born was Allahu Akbar. Again, when he was murdered in the mihrab, his last statement in the sanctuary of Kufa, mihrab, the mosque of Kufa, is again Allahu Akbar. He started his life with Allahu Akbar, and he ended his life, his earthly life, with Allahu Akbar, with the Lord, in the service of his Lord, dedicated his entire life liwajhillahi ta'ala, for the sake of his Lord. Historians say that night when Ali raised his voice with Allahu Akbar, this voice reverberated in the entire city of Kufa, penetrated every house, every room in the city. People woke up at the sound of Ali, at the voice of Ali. He concluded the Adhan, Ya Mu'mineen, he came down, Allahu Akbar, the final moment in his life. He came down to do Nafilatul Fajr. It's mustahab to do two rak'ah before Salatul Fajr. The mosque was still not crowded. People were started to come after the Adhan. They walked to the masjid. There were only few people, and among them, Abdurrahman ibn Muljam, 
who was hiding the sword behind him when Amir al Mu'mineen stood for his Salat, Salatul Nafila, Nafilatul Fajr. He did his Qiyam, he went to Ruku'. When he arrived into Sujood, he puts his head into prostration. Subhana Rabbi al A'la wa bihamdih. When he raises his head from Sujood, Abdul Rahman was standing behind him. He strikes him on his head. He deals him with a blow on his head. On his head, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Once he felt this strike, the first sentence he said, he said, Fustu wa rabbil ka'bah. Fustu wa rabbil ka'bah. I succeeded. I'm victorious by the Lord of the house. Fustu wa rabbil ka'bah. Qatalan ibn al Yahudiyya. And then they heard the voice between the heaven and the earth. Ala, ala, tahaddamat wallah arkaan al-huda. Wan hadamat al-urwat al-wuthqa. Wan fasamat al-urwat al-wuthqa. Qutila aliyun al-murtada. Today the foundation of religion has been demolished. Today al-urwat al-wuthqa, the handle of faith, has been destroyed. Ali al Murtada has been murdered today. Qutila Aliyun al Murtada qatalahu ashqal ashqiya. Then Hassan and Hussein, they rushed to their father. They saw him saturated with his blood, drenched with his blood. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Fabakahu al Mala'u al A'la daman. وغدا جبريل بالويل ينادي هدمت والله أركان الهدى حيث لا من منذر فينا وهادي نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله We going to continue with the nights of عزاء and morning of أمير المؤمنين tomorrow Friday and Saturday the last night and inshallah, Laylatul Qadr, the grand night of Qadr, Laylatul Qadr al-Kubra is going to be Monday, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Oh.